All right, all right, all right. That is right. We are live, and this is Live Life Better. And this is my podcast. We are living it better every day. Mm-hmm. I can't sing, but that's okay. <clears throat> because I can still speak. So that means we can do the podcast. Uh, today, we talk to John Rose. John Rose is a former pro surfer turned humanitarian. He was the founder of of Waves for Water, a nonprofit organization bringing clean drinking water to the world. This guy is an awesome dude doing incredible things for humanity. Um, he uh, was in Indonesia when uh, one of the big earthquakes happened uh, over 15 years ago, and the stuff he saw uh, changed his life forever, and he decided to uh, dedicate his life to humanitarian aid. and. Uh, God bless him for doing that. Yeah, he is amazing. And I hope you guys like the podcast. It's pretty cool, pretty special to hear about his stuff. Hope you enjoy. Thanks for coming uh, in today, man. You're welcome. Um, you're doing incredible work. Uh, you've been doing so for how many years now? Um, 2009 is when I started Waves for Water. So um, math is not my <laughs> strong, <laughs> strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> we all have that's our okay. strengths, you know, <laughs> that's not mine. That's, um, that's awesome. I mean, um, you started it because you were in Indo, right? Mm-hmm. And you were there during the tsunami. Yeah, it, actually not the tsunami, the one that everyone talks about, the Aceh It one. wasn't the tsunami. That okay. was 04. That was 04. Um, 09 was a massive earthquake. Over 10,000 people died. Um, no tsunami. It happened underneath Padang. Oh, wow. So there was no tsunami. You know, it has sure. to happen underwater for those to happen. Uh-huh. And, um, and and there's still no, no exact number on how many people died. That's the presumed number because you just don't know. They don't have like census sure. going around, stuff like that. But it was a big one. But you were on a boat when it happened. I was on a boat. I was on a surf trip um, with some good buddies of mine. Um, I had the idea for the organization before that. Uh, probably in the spring, it really hit me because my dad was doing work in that same space. My dad's a carpenter or was a carpenter, and um, but just like the master solutionist. Okay. He's just the ultimate problem solver. Uh-huh. So at one point, a few years prior to that, he he decided or he, he saw something on New York Times, like why, why are these women walking, you know, six miles to get uh, basically dirty water? Why, why don't they just catch rain? Sure. Not because he uh, invented the idea, but because it existed and he was just like, this doesn't make sense. Problem solving, hat on. Decided to go over, save up some money, go to Africa and try and help this one village that he read about to catch rain. And this was five years prior to me starting Waste for Water probably. Now, I was a pro surfer at that time and um, pretty pretty focused on myself. Sure. Um, and naturally so. You know, anybody who's in like a, a especially sports or performance driven thing, you know, that's that's your job. It's, it's not only your job and your passion, but it is your livelihood too. Sure. So I was focused on that and but very supportive of him as well. And um, just like, go dad, go. That's a, That's awesome. But didn't really think too much of it. When I started transitioning out of that career, basically the translation for for what I just said is when I realized all the younger kids were better than me, mm-hmm. um, I decided uh, to start looking around and just seeing like, okay, what's the next chapter of my life look like? I turned pro out of high school. I had never had another job. So this is age what? This that is you're age sort of 30. Age 30. Yeah. 30, 29, 30. It's just, it's just a, it's a sobering reality. Uh-huh. You know, it's just, it's, and it's inevitable. Yeah. You know, people, you're, you're young and you're yep. killing it and you're the guy. And then it just goes, whoosh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the arc. Yeah. And I was always a realist about it. I was never the best guy. I was never, you know, but I had my place in the, in the community and, um, and it was starting to fade away and contracts are going away and all that stuff. So it was, and I was married at the time, not in a, it wasn't a very good marriage. It was good. She was great, but we weren't good Sure. at that point. Um, and it was just that big life, like slap in the face. What am I doing? Yeah. You know, what am I going to do with my life? And, um, the next chapter I'd never thought, I thought I was put on this earth to be a pro server. I mean, mm-hmm. at that point in my time, um, and I, uh, decided, you know, while I'm transitioning, while I'm exploring, I want to do something similar to what my dad's doing. And 
ultimately it still came from a selfish place, but I'm very okay with, with, um, acknowledging that. I mean, basically it was like, I want an excuse to go back and surf the places that I love, sure. no matter whatever, what my next chapter, my next job's going to be. I want to be able to go back to Indonesia twice a year and surf and genuinely help. And I speak candidly about all that because it's the truth and it's also okay. It wasn't supposed to be my job. It was just like, oh, this, I'll rally my base. I'll rally all my crew and we'll go surf and we'll help these people. Why not? That sounds awesome. So that was the inception of Waves for Water. It was really just this title change in my life and the cause itself got on my radar because my dad and also it seemed solvable to me. I was not an expert. I wasn't an engineer or scientist or anything like that. It seemed solvable because your dad had figured out the figured out a solution. No, just 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 access to clean water seemed solvable to me. Okay. I mean, I was I I was the son of a solutionist, uh -huh. so in that sense, I was resourceful. I was I was definitely really good at the world at that point. I wasn't necessarily a scientist or an engineer or something, but I you traveled I, around and you spent your whole life on the road. So you had perspective. I, I knew human behavior. Sure. I knew communities. I knew culture and diversity. Um, I'd been exposed to a lot of that. So I felt like, okay, well there is solutions that exist. And my dad was helping in teaching people how to catch rain. Um, but, but I started thinking, well, it's not that hard to dig a well. I mean, I, I you don't, you just got to get the right machinery. I can learn that. And I'm, if, if I can't learn it, I, I'll find somebody who does it really well and I'll just put them in the right place, you know, and the same goes for filtration. You know, it was like, I'm a, I, I'm an outdoorsman. I, I always had little filters that I buy at REI. Mm -hmm. Like what, what do you mean? Water, All these standard water pump being like on a, on a big backpacking trip, you mean? Exactly. Sure. You know, so like may, knowing that maybe that's not the solution and that's like that specific filter might not be the solution, but the technology existed and I knew that. And I was just like, okay, well, these people are suffering and they don't need to suffer. There's technology that exists. They just don't know the technology or vice versa. So the people who did the hard work and invented and developed the technology, it's not necessarily their job to know who needs it and how to get it to them. And the people who need it don't know it exists. So it's just a hole in the market in a sense. Mm -hmm. And that's where that big epiphany happened for me where I said, well, why don't I just bring some of these solutions? Why don't I be that, be that bridge? Why don't I just be the person who, who brings the solution to the problem? And so that's where the very first idea came. And I just said, well, the perfect opportunity, I'm going to Indonesia and, um, I'm going to buy 10 water filters, my own money and I'll offload this them. This is in 2009. Yep. And, uh, we went to the Mentawai islands. Are so these expensive? These water filters? They were $20, 20 bucks each. Yeah. Wow. So spent a hundred bucks and, um, and how, how big are they? What, what, what are the size of these things? These things, these aren't the ones we're using now, but th these at the time were like grapefruit size and they were ceramic domes. So they, they basically the application and the reason why these were, were focused towards humanitarian aid or relief as opposed to like backpacking per se is because of the application. And that's really what uh, draws the distinction between those two is, is the application for us going out the backpacking. You have this cool little pump sure. and it's great. Small, you can, compact. Yeah. And you, and you can put it in your backpack and then it serves you. But the technology inside of that pump could serve a lot more people if it was a different application. Sure. So these ones attached to a five gallon bucket. So a plastic bucket, which is the uni most universally used item in the world. Really? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that's in any book, but I know it because I, <laughs> <laughs> you've been there. <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it. And, uh, I mean, it's used for food. It's used for, for any type of raw material, cook material. It doesn't matter. People use it to transport stuff. It is, they are everywhere. So that's one really big plus for what we do is as a big part of the system we get locally. Sure. So you get these five gallon bucket and you put this grapefruit sized, um, filter right in the bottom of that bucket. You drill a little hole and there's a stem that goes through that hole out to the outside of the bottom of that bucket and then into another bucket. So you stack the buckets. You have a picture of it, Tim, you can pull up. Um, you probably won't, the bucket. 
Yeah, that's that's, that's the newer, newer system. That's the newer system. There is some some photos I can give give you guys um, from that Indonesia stuff. But um, anyways, it's similar. The the it's all still using five gallon buckets. But you know, it's so easy to put that thing together and take any water source and put it in there and make it safe. I mean, it takes those ones were ceramic, so they had to like they had to saturate and drip through. They're a little slower. The ones we use now are called point of use, so they just immediately it's like a water fountain. Wow! So the technology has gotten better, but the point is like even in the beginning, the beginning with those ones that weren't as good, they didn't last as long. They didn't you know weren't as quick. They still took dirty water that would kill you and make it safe. Sure. In a matter of minutes, and I remember being thrust into this big earthquake setting you were on the boat when it happened yeah i was on the boat we felt it we had hit rough seas what is an earthquake like on a boat it's surprisingly the same really it's bizarre you'd think that the water would buffer you a little bit from that but it doesn't because it's the water's still on the earth so it's still tectonic plate shaking and the earth is still shaking yeah so it's bigger than the water in a sense you know wow and um, we were close to shore too, so maybe that had something to do with it. But it, it um, we got on the CB, we felt it, and then we got on the CBA. There's been a massive quake, and still you don't know much, right? Sure. And then we kind of hit rough seas, so we got in late that night. We were supposed to go check into our hotel that night. We just never did. We decided to stay on the boat in the harbor that night. And when we woke up, we got a view of Padang, which was a city that we had. It's it's the thoroughfare for all these Mentawai boat trips. Yeah. Um, it's for people who don't know that's in Indonesia. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> Indonesia. It's okay, we're the both cap- surfers. So the, we're just like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The capital, like, the capital of Sumatra is Padang and it is, uh, the, really the Harbor where everyone goes through to go on these surf trips. So, and there's 300,000 people that live there 300 to 500. It's a, it's a big, big area. And we start getting reports in the morning and you just start seeing off the bow of the boat and you see, an unrecognizable city, especially for someone who recognizes it very well. Mm -hmm. I've been through there a dozen times at that point in my life. So I, I I knew landmarks, I knew like buildings and it was, they weren't there anymore or there was just smoke and fire and just wow, really, really heavy. um, You pull up some pictures of that, uh, Tim, the 2009 earthquake. Mm, I think there's some in there. There's a Haiti there. Yeah. It would be way down probably. Um, I think I've posted stuff on that on there before. Um, but you can even just write in 2009 earthquake Sumatra. Um, but yeah, it, it was just one. Of, I wasn't a disaster relief person. I didn't, you know, that was a total, you know, slap in the from the universe. Just going, sure. all right. And you're like on a boat at that time in that part of the world. You could have been in that city a day before. Well, half the building that we stayed in, that the hotel that we were supposed to stay in fell. Wow. And we didn't check in that night. So like it, there was all these things. Yeah. The, the, the serendipitous nature or, or sort of miraculous nature of the whole thing was apparent. It was powerful and it was, um, uh, moving, you know, I, I, I felt like as cheesy as it sounds, I felt like, okay, I'm listening. <laughs> I'm listening and it felt divine. I'm not like a traditionally religious person, Mm -hmm. but it felt like this bigger force saying, all right, bud, you're not listening. And now you're listening. So we got your attention and, and it's go time. And that's really what it felt like. It felt like a complete laser focus, um, interruption into the existing pattern of my life. Sure just straight cutting through everything to the point where I was just like, this is what I'm going to do. This is why I'm here. It felt that, that poignant and that powerful to me. And, you know, it was, it was, then it was just sort of like allowing it to unfold. Cause when you feel that power within yourself, when you feel that, that connected, you, you just kind of have to let go. And then it all unfolds. I mean, all I really had to do was go in, find a relief center, 
teach him how to use these filters. And I say all I had to do, it's not that it's that easy. It was, it was intimidating. It was, this is, this is right after the earthquake. You were like, okay, what can we do right now? Yeah. Well, I just said, I have these filters. So instead of going and giving them to these villages that I had planned on, um, which was, I was going to do the next day. Um, I'm just, these guys, I mean, it just came down to common sense at that point. It just, I just clicked into like, okay, just normal guy survival common sense mode. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, well I have the, these filters, these people need them probably more than the village that I went, that I was planning on going to. And you just start going through that sequence. And I'd like ask somebody local person, Hey, is there a relief center around here? Cause that just seemed like the right place to take it. Sure. And then you, you go, you start getting momentum. So you get to the relief center and you, you see the relief workers walking around kind of like zombies because most of the tasks at that point are too big for them to handle. You know, you need like heavy lifters and like big machinery, totally get people out of places, proper search and rescue. And, and, and they're doing as much as they can, but you can see no one's ever dealt with something like this. You know, it was just like deer in headlights look. And, um, this was a tangible project. This was a really fun, um, not fun in the time, but like, fun in the way that it made you feel you're sure. like okay we can get behind this yeah like momentum let's do this and you start you have a, a, a attainable task let's go get a bucket and you get on the back of a scooter with a guy and you're going through literally looks like a war zone and you have this super direct mission and you go get a bucket and you find one and we couldn't find one because uh, all the stores were down and we found these old gasoline cans that hadn't been used and i'm like okay well if we cut the you know with our knives if we cut the top off and we mimic a, what a bucket is we can do it and we did and it worked and those filters, so then you then you then you wait for rain no no rain no rain no that's a that's a separate thing that what my dad was doing so the idea with that was just more you you used current dirty water yeah just they had stagnant water yeah they had wells yeah you know they have wells behind all the buildings that that's part of an old well system in that city that is probably not been used for years, but there's water in it because it's, it urbanized that area. So it became, these wells kind of become contaminated. Sure. So I think before the earthquake, they were just using municipal water, which is still dirty, which is like piped water from some source. It's not regulated, Yeah. but they have like a semi-infrastructure that was compromised. So you look at, you know, we're looking for water and there's a well. water. What about bottled water? Was there not a lot of bottled water at the time? There was, but this is the number one first lesson that I got, which was so amazing. You know, I'm, I built the first system. I'm like, great, you guys can drink clean water. And they said, um, that's awesome. Uh, we have tons of bottled water, but we're going <laughs> to we're gonna <laughs> use that first. <laughs> well, yeah. And I, and I was like, good. That's of course, I mean, that, that makes sense. You know, yeah. but they're like, we're going to use this water to clean the wounded. Ah, and I just, my brain just went, oh, you know, I, I was like, oh my God, that's so smart. You know, I, yeah. I didn't even think about that. And then now I understand all of the uh, value in, in all the different aspects of clean water. But I, you know, coming from a developed country, when, when, when we're thirsty, if we want, we can go put our mouse, mouth on the faucet in our kitchen and drink the water and not get sick. We can take a shower whenever we want. Oh, we take it for so granted. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And, and, and I just didn't know that. And so I didn't think about like feminine hygiene, infant care, all of these things that are so crucial to somebody's health that they need clean water for. Yeah. And, and especially in these situations, the, the wounded, because international relief doesn't show up for like three days when these things happen. So you've got three days for people. And if it's really cut down, you have a limited source of bottled water, yep. it's going to go for hydration. And these people get gangrene pretty easy. Yeah. You know, there's two tents. There was t- when I went to the first relief center, there was one tent with dead bodies, collecting dead bodies and one with wounded. And then we took our systems to those tents and so in turn, those systems, even those small little systems helped thousands of people. Yeah. You know, beyond more than if people were just drinking it. And and people don't realize that that 72 hours is really the most critical time in a disaster. Totally. I don't, did you ever know uh, Paul Walker? Yeah. Um, so Paul was our good friend. Uh, and, you know, for people who don't know, he started Reach Out Worldwide, which is, you know. They're, they've been an ally of ours and a partner of ours on many projects. 
Yeah. So we're close with those guys. <clears throat> yeah. And they're awesome. I, I just recently saw Paul's brother and their crew um, in Haiti. I think the last time I saw them was in Haiti for Hurricane Matthew. Okay. I saw them on the ground. We like ran into each other with, we had a couple of mutual contacts down there. So it was good. I'd never met um, his brother. Uh, what's his brother's name? Cody. Cody. That's yep. right. Yeah. Um, but we just in passing, but yeah, those guys are um, definitely friends and allies of ours. Cool. So you're there, you, you, they start using the water from the buckets that you can filtrate to clean the wounds, to clean, you know, to help people out. Um, and then you guys are down there for how long? How long did you stay? What, what? I only stayed for, I mean, I would think I was on the ground. I, I did uh, eight different relief centers. So once I did that first one, I, I I knew what my program was. Sure. I knew exactly what I needed to do. And so I just kept doing research uh, or asking around where the next ones were and I'd get on somebody else's scooter and we'd go find buckets, you know, and do the same process. So um, I was, that whole process for all eight centers took about, probably 30 hours, I'd say. Um, once that was done, we, I jumped on a plane, came home and just was laser focused. I'm like, okay, this has changed me forever. Undoubtedly. I mean, I think even just going through that type of an experience, regardless if you have a tool to help just seeing and being exposed to something like that, which, which is pretty rare and uncommon for most people. You're just not, most people are just not going to be exposed to some, that level of intensity and um, just suffering. Yeah. So it has a profound effect. Then on top of it, if you can help, if you actually have viable tools to help. And that just, and then coupled with the transition in my life, the transition period in my life, it all just polarized, you know, it just went. Uh, sort or sort of crystallized it all just went straight into this uh, laser focus of I need to go home and get as much money as I can to get as many filters as I can to get back to Indonesia and I went and I did I came back um, asked every friend that I had um, funny not funny but little sidebar of the Indo piece was uh, there was a some news thing that came out because when the earthquake happened you know news picks it up and uh, there was I think it was Channel 11 or KTLA or one of these like uh, Los Angeles news stations that that did a did a piece saying that I was presumed dead. That you were. Yeah. So they, they somehow my my thing or my sort of assessment on why they did that was I think when you've got five stations covering the same piece, they're trying to find the angle to make their story a little different, and somehow that one knew that I was a local pro surfer from the LA area. So I think, hold on, sorry. Um, I think they, whenever there's Americans abroad and there's those things, the embassy will send notices or get the information of which Americans are at what hotels. They did that with our hotel. We Your never, hotel was we good. never showed up. Got it. So all of us were <clears throat> presumed missing. But because I, they felt I was somehow relevant uh, storyline or something at being a being a pro server from the area, they said John Rose, you know, pro server presumed dead. Um, my wife at the time saw that. I didn't have cell service, so I, I I ended up getting cell service like five minutes after that thing aired. Oh wow! And calling in, and everyone's just freaking out. Um, so I I didn't know all that stuff was even happening at home, but um. I didn't die. That's good. <laughs> Bigger how, things were meant for you. Yeah. Yeah. But how, how big is the, the clean water problem in the world? I mean, like, you know, like we mentioned, we take it all for granted. We just turn on the faucets. I mean, is this, you know? Yeah, it's a one in nine. Don't, one in nine doesn't have Don't have, have water. access to clean water, um, which has changed since I started the organization. And not saying it's because of us, but um, it has, we've contributed towards the, the, that statistic getting better for sure. But it was one in six when I started. Wow. So that's cool. That's encouraging yeah. for me. And yeah, but I mean, it's a massive problem. I mean, every 15 minute, a baby, every 15 minutes, a baby dies from dirty water. Where is the biggest problem? Or uh, what developing countries are? It, 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 it depends. I mean, it's more like regions. 
okay. than countries. I mean, you, you you know you have many countries in in Africa, yeah. almost all of them, um, e- even ones that are more developed, aren't necessarily fully developed. Sure. I mean, there's th- there's probably only seven c- countries in the world that are actually fully developed. And that doesn't mean that all the other ones, the other ones are third world or, or really, really underdeveloped. It just means that if you're talking nationwide, all pillars of infrastructure met. Sure. Like I, you know, we, the United States doesn't qualify for that. <laughs> yeah, you can you can start to, you can start to uh, go down that path with that, and so and I don't nitpick it, but it, that's the truth, right? You know, like a, a, a homeless person in America can, for the most part, walk into a Seven Eleven, go into the bathroom and put their mouth on the sink and drink the water for free, right. and not get sick. Unless you live in Michigan. Unless you live in Michigan, right. there's a little pockets, yeah, for sure. But you know, there's other countries that that have Japan, you know, Germany, places like that 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 you can do the same thing. And it's not just water; it's more or less, you know, education, healthcare. Not that they're perfect, but they have them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so when you break it down with the real water crisis of the world, um, it's more like regions. So definitely Africa as a region. Um, Southeast Asia for sure, Central and South America for sure, Middle East for sure. Um, so you've got, um, and then within those regions, you've got real hot spots. Sure. You know, you've got places like, um, you know, uh, Uganda and and uh, Nigeria and places, you know, and Af- other places of like Mozambique. They all have really big problems. Um, even in even in Asia, Thailand is a, has a huge problem, and there, that's like one of the biggest tourist destinations in the world. Yeah, you know, Philippines, Myanmar, um, all over. You know, we work in South America as well, in Brazil, Argentina, um, Central America, Panama, Nicaragua. They all have it. So, how did you scale it up? You're on a boat in Indo. This earthquake happens. You come home. You're motivated. Um, I you know I was thinking a lot about this uh, recently, and the scale happened i really believe it's just like if you you know it's almost that cliche saying like if you put your mind to something it, you know if you build it, it they will come type thing um if you truly are in your power like you are really connected with what you feel like your purpose is everything else follows there was no plan to scale anything Mm. I didn't have, cause I, I was forced recently to think about my big vision for this whole thing. And I'm like, I, I don't know what that is really, you know? And, and now I've become more clear on that because of this exercise that I did. But I realized that I never really had some massive vision. All I wanted to do was go solve the problem. And I just put my head down and worked tirelessly at that. And and all of this other stuff happens. So you have one opportunity. So at first it was just laser focus, getting back to Indonesia, come home, ask as many friends as I can, you know, some dough, some dough, like, Hey, these things are 20 bucks. Like I can carry probably a few hundred and they contributed. I brought 200 more filters back there in a month, a month later, went straight back and then came back home. And you know, that was like, okay, well I want to get more money and I want to go over there. And then, a month later, Haiti happened, uh, the 2010 earthquake, and um, someone had seen someone who was mobilizing troops, basically a team to go down to Haiti and do some relief. Uh, they had a, a decent nest egg of funds to do. They wanted to do water, food, and medical. Had seen some of the the press from that Indonesia story, like you know, there was some press just because of that miraculous nature of us being there and all that stuff. And they just called me out of the blue and said, "Hey, is what you did in Haiti or uh, in Indonesia viable for Haiti?" And I said, "Yeah, for sure." Uh, and I didn't know for sure, but I said, "Yeah, yeah I think so." Um, okay, do you want to go tomorrow? Yeah, I'm in. And they basically gave me a, you know, I started with twenty, uh, ten filters uh, for the first trip. Then came home, raised as much as I could for those other ones, just from friends. Went over there, did the work. It's all real simple is my point. It was just straightforward. Like you have your goal. It wasn't like, okay, I want to scale this organization into a massive global initiative. I was just like, I know where the need is right now and I can serve that need personally. 
and I'm just gonna do that. And I was also at a crossroads in my life. I was getting divorced. I basically left everything. Once Haiti happened, I just left and moved to Haiti. And I and and so it's talk about scale. I mean, it went from ten filters to then coming home a month later. I was able to get like two hundred, and take that to Indonesia. And then all of a sudden, I had forty thousand dollars to do as much as I could with as many as I could uh, with that money for Haiti. Two months after that, still not scaling the organization, typically speaking. Sure. But that's scale, and that's a pretty crazy trajectory. Um, but it was still just me. I didn't, th- I didn't have any staff. I didn't have anything. Haiti alone, just trying to communicate with yeah. locals and saying, okay, this will help you yeah. here and this gives you water and okay, on to the next person. Yeah, I have no doubt in my mind that if you were put in that position, you would do the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. You, it, you know, it just comes down to common sense. I, did I make mistakes? A million. Yeah. But it's just, you know what your goal is. And, and then you, you realize what you need to achieve that goal. So you're like, well, I don't speak Creole. Yep. I need a translator. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like basic common common sense. Right. So I'm like, okay, well, I, it's pretty, pretty intense right now in this area. I need a good driver. I need, you know, that kind of stuff. So these are all just basic things that are actually coming a little bit easier to us at that time because it's only relief workers. I'm, I'm camping in a in a relief camp with uh, other aid workers and I'm just focused on water. Some of them are doctors, some are doing rubble removal, whatever. And we're all just there. So we become like a central command. And there was a lot of these outposts throughout Port-au-Prince. And I stayed, I thought I was gonna go for two weeks. I stayed for two years. Two years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So you saw, I mean, the entire aftermath, everything. Everything. And I'm still there. I mean, the thing is, is that Haiti's by far the thing closest to my heart, the place closest to my heart. Um, we, we have programs in over 40 countries now. Mm-hmm. Um, but Haiti is my, cause it, it, it was that organic scaling. Like I was just explaining to you, but it also really did contribute to us being where we are today and on a global scale, because I was at the epicenter of the aid world, um, watching every single rubbing shoulders with every single organization out there, big and small and just observing, knowing what my day-to-day routine was and what my agenda was, was to just find new pockets of need, go out there with my little crew, teach these people how to use them and in the most sustainable way, and then repeat that process in, in other pockets of need. So I knew that for me, but then I was also through osmosis learning all of this stuff about the aid world. So as, and it was perfect What did timing. you learn about the aid world? How challenging the, the, it is. How the good, bu- the bad, and the ugly. Yeah, just the bureaucratic <laughs> process. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Because everything I've been explaining to you guys has been, I mean, that's pragmatism, right? Sure. It's common sense. One man, I don't have to answer to anybody. Get I, shit done. Get shit done, you know? Yep. And, it, and it's easy for me to say like, oh, it's, you guys are doing it wrong. You know, it's easy because I'm alone. I can do whatever I want, you know? And so I, I learned humility through that too because I did I did point fingers you know, in the beginning I did like, you guys are blowing it. You need to, it's simple. It's right here. But then as you scale, you know, you, you, it doesn't mean you, you can't be just as efficient. I still very much believe that, but you have more things taken into in consideration. Sure. And, and they're on the full other end of the spectrum. A lot of those big ones where they're, they've gotten so far away from it where it's not e- efficient and it's so bureaucratic. And so, and it can, there's so many regulations and rules preventing the solutions to actually f- find the problem and just you know m- marry the problem and 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 there most of them are pretty easy to implement you just have to put in the time to do it um so it was just a crash course in all of those uh lessons i mean it was it was the, the humanitarian aid world it was disaster relief world it was developing countries you know i'd been a lot of spent a lot of time in developing countries as a surfer, but I was always like, when's the tide getting low? You know, like (laughs) not really fully immersing. And this was dug in. I mean, two whole years of your life living in Haiti, Mm -hmm. just doing relief. Yeah. Just bringing water. Yeah. That's, you're a better man than I. I mean, that is, um, that's incredible. Well, if I took you to Haiti, you'd love it. So (laughs) 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 thank you. I appreciate that. But it's, um, 
it's one of the most special places in the world and it's challenging. And of course, at that time it was really challenging, but I was also up for the challenge. I'm a competitor, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm an, I wouldn't, I'm an athlete. So you, you went, you literally <clears throat> went from being a pro surfer, married to all of a sudden cast into your eat, sleep in and breathing relief effort, water, getting to people. Where was your psyche at during all that? Were you, were you like this big transmissional period? Like, what am I doing? What's going on? Was it, did you feel like did, you knew this was what I needed to do? Yeah, I knew a hundred percent. I knew that that's what I was going to do. And, and uh, knowing who my character and the type of person that I am, I can, once I'm like locked in on something, I, I have crazy work ethic on it and crazy commitment to it. And it's just so at all costs type thing. Like I'm, and, and that's been the greatest passions of my life. I'd, I'd say the first was wanting to make a profession out of the thing that I loved as a kid and was just laser focused on that. And then this was the second and probably part of the reason why my marriage failed because that wasn't it. That wasn't one of those things. Sure. You know, so, so I think this was, it was all the timing of it all, you know? So it was, it was the leaving of that one chapter and including included in that the marriage and all that stuff which i if you think about it i could just dive into this thing and keep my mind busy yeah um and i had a lot of time on my own i mean i was living in a tent for six months um and when we had no showers we i was taking these little bottles of water like this that were donated down there and get my board shorts on at the end of the day and like you know (laughs) bird bath shake and bake bird bath yeah Um, but I think the, the, it was a fortunate situation for me because had I had, had I had a normal life and been, you know, I was living in Laguna beach at the time. Um, let's say I got divorced and all that stuff was happening. I was trying to, let's say none of this happened and I'm, my surfing career is done. What am I going to do? Probably work in the industry, which nothing wrong with that. I just wasn't passionate about that. So, you yep. know, just take a job, uh, with one of the companies that, that maybe I sponsored me, um, then probably still end up divorced, but in the same town and running into, you know, this was like clean, clean and done and gone. And I don't know, psychologically speaking, I mean, I'm sure I could get psychoanalyzed for days, but, um, I don't know if psychologically speaking that is good or bad, but for me, it was perfect because, and and I think it was good for every, all parties. Yeah. I think it was just like, this is your calling. And it was a bigger thing than just that transition. I think this really is a calling of mine. So I I was, I was almost not inventing that. I was returning to it, it felt like. It almost felt like a return, like this is who I am and this is what I'm gonna do. And it all felt so right that spending two years in Haiti just felt like that. You know It just went by quick. Yeah, just I was just totally centered in in what I was supposed to be doing. I felt I didn't feel like I needed to be or wanted to be anywhere else in the world. Wow. At any time. So then why did you leave Haiti? What what did you just feel like your time was done there? Everything was yeah, and so when I say left, I never left. I mean, I, I I just don't live there full time, but I spend a lot of time there still. We still do a ton of work there. Um, that was just the, the hardcore period of being there and putting my 100% focus on that. And in that in that two years, we started to, I started to go, God, well, what we're doing here has really blossomed and we're having some great progress. And there's so many other places in the world that I've been to that need this. And that's that going back to the scale thing. That that was sort of my first thoughts of scale. You know, I'm like, okay, well, what if we did this also? We'll keep doing Haiti because I built a local team. And but what if we do this other places? And then it was happened organically. I mean, there was this massive flooding in Pakistan. Um, some of the people I was working with in Haiti rallied to to provide aid for for them over there and rolled us into their plan. So they said, can you handle it? I said, yes. So we did it. And that's how you that's that's how you guys funded the next leg. Yeah. They just said, We're gonna include you in our budget here and Yeah. I had no um office. Yeah. I had no home. 
I had no expenses other than the half of my expenses for my previous for my marriage, um, which I, I was more than happy to do with whatever money I had left, you know, because I left and I said, look, I'll take care of my half of the bills and all that kind of stuff for as long as I can. Um, but we it was an amicable split. So it, it was just kind of like that. That's that that was my I felt like definitely my responsibility. And I did that. But I had no expenses. I was living in a tent. I had no office, no overhead. I had no staff. I, I didn't even have personal expenses. I was eating aid food. food. You know, I was living in a tent. And, and, and slowly but surely, we started to get more projects like in Haiti that were proper, like we'd partner with the UN and we'd do a contract with them because I started building a reputation for having a good program. And we st I started, it, that was the proving ground. I mean, Haiti, those two years was my uh, master's. That was my schooling. That was everything uh, in, in the work that we're doing. So, so much of what we do today and how we do it was, was formed from that, that time there. It was so crucial and valuable. This is a picture of the hurricane, huh? Yeah. That's from just the last one, that's the Caribbean. The oh, that's the last one. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I did. So, and then, and then Brazil happened. There was another thing in Brazil and somebody reached out to me. Then it started getting like, we got a site up. I finally got my 501c3 status, like, you know, started working backwards almost. Sure. Um, it was cool applying for our 501c3 because I had already been working. You'd already like, done the hard work. Yeah. You'd already been there doing it, right? Yeah. So when it comes to the narrative process, you have to write a narrative for that application. Uh -huh. I was showing them photos and testimonials of real stuff that had already happened, not what I wanted to do. And it got, a, our 501c3 got approved in less than 30 days, which is like pretty unheard of for for that stuff. It was just a fun little side note on, on that process. Now I know more, but at the time I was like, yeah, well, it's cool. And we, we got a site built, you know, people started to learn more what we were doing. And then it just, it just snowballed in the sense of the need was always there. And now this seemed for a certain group of people, this seemed like a viable way to speak to that need, mm -hmm. you know, for, for, I like to say for non-traditional, for non-traditional aid people, probably people like you and me, I care about the world, but I wasn't like a natural do-gooder growing up. I didn't do bake sales or you know whatever <laughs> growing up. Uh -huh. I just wasn't my thing. You know, I wanted to be a pro, pro athlete. That's, that's what I want to do. And, and, and I still cared about people and humanity, but there, the larger percentage of the world is like that. And the super small percentage of the world that's just born doing good out of the womb yeah. is small. It's a small percentage. So I think all of a sudden with this story and then the platform that we created and the momentum we had, it started triggering or resonating with that larger percentage. Like people are like, wait, this is cool. Like I get it. I get, that makes sense. Let's do this. It wasn't like, black black hole red cross where you just throw your money and you're like where is that going it was tangible it was like yeah i know that guy or like he's on the ground there you know that's cool and it was simple as that and i think that we've kept that spirit not even intentionally just because that's who we are today and we're a bit you know what are you guys today how many employees where what we have about 40 um global full-time employees yeah um not not really full time. I'd say probably twenty five full, and then another fifteen that are part in those countries um, that are definitely under our fold, and they're we're paying them on some level, but they're not full time. Maybe they have another job. Sure. And, and then, and then none of that's including the volunteers in those places when when we ramp up, because that can be hundreds. If when you we, ramp up, if, if there's a natural disaster or something yeah. that happens. So, so what I've really tried to do is build a small team sort of laterally at the top. So like these more higher level positions, but placed all over the world, these like region managers, and they're always on call and ready because there's always active programming in their region at least. And what they've been able to do is then when things happen in those regions, they, they mobilize and ramp up accordingly in that specific place but it comes from like the region head. And the cool thing is that almost all, actually all those region heads were people that went through our program first. Oh wow. Because I met them from going to their country mm -hmm. 
and helping them or, you know, sort of, um, enlisting them in our program at that time. And then them just saying, Hey, I want to be involved with this on a bigger level, fostering that. And then them ultimately being able to cross borders and, and, and pay forward the knowledge and expertise that they learn personally through going the, pro- going through the program to neighboring countries. Sure. So it's an awesome, not only empowerment sort of model, but, uh, it's, it really is true development. Um, so it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's been great. We still don't have an office. (laughs) That's great. Yeah. Yeah, Waste of money. Sounds like your office is wherever you guys are. Yeah. Which is, I mean, that's what a charity really should be at its core. Totally. Right. hundred percent. You know, I mean, I hear horror stories of a lot of charities that are, you know, people are in it you know, to make a dollar and turn a profit. And there's a lot of people sucking money out of them. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of them do great. Um, yeah. But, you know, a lot of the money goes elsewhere. Oh, totally. And and I mean, I'm not even going to worry about all those guys. Like, yep. I just know mm-hmm. who we are and what we want to do. And we've been praised at times for our our ideas and our model and criticized equally. What's the criticism? Um. I mean, it comes in all forms. It comes from um, disbelief that it can actually be that way. So like, no way, they must be, there must be a scam there. There must be, there's no way they can be as in as many of these places, but have that lean of a, you know, there's that skepticism because people, okay. people always, well, now with the whole space in general, there is a guilty till proven innocent deal. Yeah. It just yeah. is. And that's unfortunate because that's, and that's f- thanks to those big dogs that, that have made it that way. Yep. They've, there's been corruption after corruption um, case. And so we have that, you know, so there's certain people that are kind of skeptical or they don't really know, or there's the UN saying, hey, um, we'd love to do this program with you in Haiti, but it's come up a couple times in meetings that you guys don't have a big enough presence here. And and I know our presence is bigger, 10 times bigger than any other organization. So other down people there. dogging you guys? Well, no. Like th- what they mean, pres- I, I finally got like a, the scoop from one of the guys, and he goes, presence means offices throughout the country. Mm. Wow. And I'm like, so I'm going to have five offices throughout that the country that are going to be sitting idle with people just sitting in there when we're not doing this pro- program with you, just so that you can say on paper that we have a presence there. And and he goes, no, you're right. He's like, your your model is good. It, don't change it. But I'm just telling you, that's what's come up. And I said, you know, and we ended up still getting the project. Okay. But it's those types of criticisms because you're doing it differently. You're lean and mean. Lean and mean. Yeah. Why, why doesn't the UN or the US Army or whatever, I mean, $20 a filter? They do. They do. Yeah. I mean, what they've done over 10 programs with us. Right. Uh, we, we partner with the U.S. military a ton mm-hmm. and the U.N. Um, there's so many divisions within all those, within those those big organizations that the biggest challenge I see is just the bureaucratic nature of the whole the whole system. So you've got like guys that come in on on one year rotations or six month rotations. So let's say me and you, you come in, you're you're super clear and you've got a good head and you're like, awesome. I love this program. Let's do it. So you go through all the steps to get it passed, which takes a little time. Let's say a few months. Mm -hmm. We go do our first pilots pilot program together. Um, it goes great. You've got it all built to go to the next step and teed up and then you rotate out. Some guy wants to come and inject his own DNA into the project. Exactly. And he's like, no, I got a better thing. Yeah. I want to do this way or, yeah. I, you know, this buddy who's doing this thing or that or something, right? Exactly. So that's how I've seen many, many programs get squashed. Our programs, I know I, I'm, if it's happening to us, I'm sure it's happening to many others. Um, so that, that's what you face a lot with that kind of stuff and, pow- and you know, power struggles, internal power struggles of people, ego, yeah. you know, same old shit that you'd see in any other business. Mm-hmm. Um, how many other people, how many other companies are doing similar, uh, water? Um, there's quite a few. I mean, there's a lot of organizations out there. Um, we, we provide access to clean water only. So some do 
you know, a, a range of solution They you know, they'll do housing, they'll do water, they'll, you know, so they'll do, they'll bring that in their fold. We only focus on access to clean water and we'll do that through rainwater harvesting, digging the construction and restoration of uh, borehole wells and filtration. So we've been talking a lot about the filtration side because that's a, sure. just such an easy, quick fix. But is that not a long term solution or can that be long term? It's definitely long term. It's not forever, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, the capacity of one of those filters is a million gallons. Okay. If you start doing that math for one family, you're talking decades. Sure. So there's, there's variables within that though, water source, how well they're taking care of it, all that kind of stuff. So, so the, the program isn't the distribution of supplies. The program is a very, very thorough educational process to implement this solution into a community so that it is used to its capacity, to its potential, because you wanna set them up to win. Not only that, you wanna, for everyone who's supporting the program, you want them to get bang for their support, for their buck, you know, sure. like. We did this. We did this and it lasted this long. Yeah. So it's our responsibility as the mechanism to introduce these solutions into the places where they're needed to do that the most thorough and sustainable way. And that's where the, the intricacies come in and that's where it gets a little bit more complicated because you are talking about human behavior. You're talking about going in and changing a, a certain pattern that's been there forever. Mm -hmm. And you know, the kid goes to the water, to the well, the well pump there that's in the middle of the village and just is thirsty, he just puts his uh, mouth right on that, um, the edge of it and drinks straight from it and gets sick every day if not worse than that. So you have to retrain people and you have to find ways to connect with them um, in a soft posture, soft sure. posturing way. You're um, like a steward almost. Kinda. For water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean. well, and, and you found a way around the bureaucracy too. You're just like, fuck you guys, I'm throwing a, a filter in my bag and I'm going. And I'm gonna teach some people how to do it and. I don't have an office. Kiss my ass. It is. It is <laughs> as know? simple as that. It is. I mean, now things are more complex, just like inevitably when you get bigger, but there it's still that. Yeah. It's just that maybe it's not just me. Right. That's the difference. And that's, that's the whole point. I mean, you want to create something that lives beyond you. And the, the key has been these regional champions. Like I can do, I can only do so much. I, not only because I'm one person, but I don't know these places. I can sure. I can say I'm good at the world, but I, I still am a foreigner and I'm still coming in, don't know the intricacies and nuances of these communities as well as a good local person does. So so to find the region people and then, then sort of the uh, village level person who's just there every day and to connect those dots and have all of them go through this process, the same one that I did, and it, which is now sort of like our protocol, and 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 learning and, and using all of the things that we've learned to be able to, but then through their voice, to their people, yeah. in in the moment, is going to help them the the recipient reach that that maximum potential of what the solution can do. That's how it gets done. That's the only way to to successfully and sustainably implement anything is that if it's like, you're the one in need and it's your cousin who's coming over like, bro, trust me, this is awesome. It's been work, you know, we've been using mm -hmm. it in our house. I'm here for you if you have any questions. But to get to that point, to, to make that happen, there's a lot of process. And that's what we really work at now. And that's, you know, I learned that in Haiti and, I, and, I, and to, to scale the organization, it's been really just replicating that around the world and refining that process. And who pays for that? Different partners. So corporate partners, just people. Yeah. So, yeah. um, we're funded, you know, it was another thing I learned in Haiti. Um, you know, I've never liked galas. I really don't like those. Nothing against people who like them. <laughs> but <laughs> they, they cost money too. Yeah. It's just Having not a gala my thing. tonight, actually. <laughs> sure you don't want to come? <laughs> I just don't like it. I mean, I just, it's just not me. You know, I don't like sitting there and doing that do dog and pony show. Pandering. Sort of yeah. Thing. And, and I know that they're there for a good reason ultimately, and there is money and there's, there's positive stuff coming out of them. But 
the point of bringing that up is that when I was developing the organization at a time when I could make these calls because I, it was mine, I'm like, well, I don't want to do galas and I don't want to fundraise at all. I don't even like asking. I hate asking for money. I, I don't want to do the, we have coffee mugs on our site and if you buy this, it, you know, all the proceeds go to this, nothing wrong with that too. But just for me, I just didn't, I just don't like it. So I started really thinking about what we did and it, was there a way around it? Was there a way around having to just be like every other organization and ask for money every single quarter and hope I got my war chest up of funds that I could then start budgeting out the next year and then just this tail wagging the dog sort of process every year? I'm like, how do I get around it? And, and at the time I was like, well, what if I approach it like contractors? What if I just made, I, I really felt that if I made the, the most badass program, like it, it was, it did what it said what it was going to do. And it was so efficient that people would pay for it. And that's how we operate. So we're, we are an, a 501c3. We are a, a charity. I hate that word more than anything. Um, this, but I, I look at what we do is development work, you know, and we, we go in and we supplement missing pieces of infrastructure in these places. And we do that with a very, very clear cut, targeted programming. And um, people pay for that. So there's people, there, there's entities in the world that have a vested interest in that place. That could be a corporation that has uh, business in that place Sure. And, and and so so you've heard of CSR before. It's called corporate social responsibility. Responsibility. Yep. That's the that's the social impact initiative in any corporation. They you kind of have to have it at this point. Yep. So we have become a good outlet for that. You know, like they'll however they come up with the funds doesn't matter to me. They can fundraise in their company. They can sell a product. They can just give us straight budget if they want to. And it's happened in all those ways. Um, so, and then, and then we d design a program in the area that they're interested in helping. We do our needs assessment. We can come back and say, okay, with the budget that you guys have and the need on the ground, we can provide this many, you know, this many people with access to clean water in this amount of time in this way. And if they agree on it, then we have our timeline together. It's, it, it's so transparent. It's sure. so just- We're gonna have X done by X time deliverables. Yep. It's the same as any other, it's the same as any other real industry, like industry that has sure. those same, uh, that same accountability and, and deliverables. And the same thing goes over to our programs with the military or our programs with other organizations. We, we approach it the same way. So it's organization, other bigger humanitarian organizations that maybe want to do water, but they just decide to sub us out for that piece. It's, big um, governmental organizations such as the UN or the military, US military, it's corporations. Um, you know, we have big program, global CSR program with BMW, for example. Oh, it's great. And um, PayPal, you know, Hurley, Nike. Um, these are some brands that we've um, done ongoing programs with. Um, and then there's private sector. And they all kind of, we kind of approach all of them the same way. If anybody comes to us, we say, this is exactly how we do it. Do they mostly come to you now? Most of them do, to be honest. Um, trying to, that's the next phase of development within the organization. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I know, of course, naturally, because I founded it. So I think people are gonna, I probably have the most years or the most um, opportunity to meet those types of people. Um, but I have a great team. I have a really great team and they are actively um, engaged in outreach um, in a way of not like cold calling so much, but like being out there and representing us in the right way and having those conversations. Sure. You know, cause we, cause now they're all familiar and we're familiar with what, what type of partner we want. So that opens the doors. If you approach it like this, I mean, and I, you know, I have nothing to hide. I, I love sharing our model. I share with everyone. I think everybody should, I think every other organization should do it the same way. Would that probably cut into some of our, our partnerships if everyone did that? Yeah, probably, but I don't care. I think it's the right thing to do for the world. I think it's the right thing to do for humanity mm -hmm. because there's such- Trim the fat. Yeah, there's accountability. Yeah. 
is it's so transparent. It's so you you've agreed upon all the terms before the project starts. It's not like you donate to me and then you hope I do good with the money. Yeah. You know, we agree upon it way beforehand and, and I have deliverables to you. And that I think I would like to encourage all organizations to just, you know, because then it then it's not charity. Yeah. It's not charity, it's true work, it's development. You're buying something for your money. We you provide know? a service, you have an interest in a place and you have and you, you want our service, the same as if you needed plumbing in your house. Yeah. You'd have a plumbing a, a plumber come over, a couple, you get bids. Imagine if you went like, you just threw money out there to plumbers and hoped they came to your house. And, <laughs> <laughs> and <fixed it. laughs> That's funny. So, what do you what what project are you? Uh, what's I mean, you guys you guys are in you know a lot of different countries right now. What's uh, what's one of the big biggest initiatives you have right now going in in which region of the world? Um, biggest right now, without a doubt, is the Caribbean. Uh, it's our uh, CHRI project, which is the Caribbean Hurricane Relief Initiative. Um, we called it that because you couldn't just say Hurricane Irma because there was two bangers that hit back to back. Sure. We went down there for Hurricane Irma um, that just wiped out a lot of the BVI and, and, and wiped out some of those neighboring islands, um, Martinique and stuff too. Um, and um, while we were there, the way we approach any disaster, like like any other disaster relief org, you, you once it hits, you mobilize, you figure out what you're gonna be doing, your timeline, your strategy, and everything like that. You get on site, but you get you don't typically stage out of ground zero. You you stage in just outside of ground zero, so you can stage. Sure. So you have what you need to stage from, and then you start planning all your strikes and what you're gonna do in that in ground zero. So we did that in Saint Croix which was the only island that didn't get hit by Irma. So we get down there, it was just a couple of days after Irma hit and it's it's bad everywhere. I mean, we had started to work already in St. John, St. Thomas, um, Tortola. And then Maria just came online, like out of nowhere, cat five in, in 12 hours. Wow. And squared off on us. Oof. And it was the first time I had ever been I've been in a lot of hurricanes. I've been in a lot of earthquakes, believe it or not, because when you go and respond to the big earthquake, if you're there within the, the days after that, you're gonna have a lot of aftershocks. Mm -hmm. So I've been in eight plus, eight, eight, eight .0 plus earthquakes. There's been aftershocks that big. Wow. So I, I've, I feel, I, I have a good understanding of what it feels like to go through these things. I've never been in a cat five hurricane when it's about to square off on you with, you know, 190 mile an hour winds. And that was a whole nother experience. That was like- uh, Oh, you bunkered down and sat through it. You yeah. guys didn't get out of there. No, no. We were like, we're the most equipped to handle what, what's gonna be like tomorrow here. So, and we already had a bunch of supplies that were supposed to go to the other islands for Irma. And we just said, okay, sorry for those islands for the for the short term, but we're, our best call is to be, I mean, we're at ground zero now. Yeah. And so we just did our due diligence and all the stuff we had learned. I mean, this at this point, this was number disaster number 22. Like a natural disaster rain man. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> the hell? Remind me not to travel with you. It'll like attract them. Um, that's, that's a very good inside joke that goes around with my friends. <laughs> It's terrible, but uh, no, but it's hap it, yeah. it literally happens. I was going back to the Mentawai Islands five years after I started the organization on, or or maybe three, three, four years. I was going finally on my first like vacation. Mm -hmm. Going, I was with Bob Hurley and a, and a whole crew. We were gonna go over there and just surf, and they were like, "Man, come over. You need a break. Like, let's go surf." And you know, we had this killer boat plan. While we're in the air, massive earthquake tsunami the one that the leveled 2004 one okay no not not 2004 this would have been 2014 or whatever oh my god um that leveled i'm not sure how familiar you are with the mentwai islands and that those breaks but like they that tsunami leveled that whole area wow this was after no one was even talking about it because there's so sure. much stuff but this is while we're in the plane so we land and now everyone's like, there's no, I don't even know if we can go out there and all this stuff. And so we just ended up turning our boat into a relief boat and going and working. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Jeez. 
wow. Yeah, these guys are like, what is going on with you? And I'm like, oh, God, I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, wait, okay. We need to go to, back to that, but I need to hear what it's like to, to be in this Category 5 hurricane. Uh, and and it's, it squares off. You guys know you're going to be without power, without anything for multiple days, maybe weeks, right? In the, in the subsequent weeks after. How do you guys operate if you know, you know, the roads might not be clear, the, you guys can't get cars, you can't gas? I mean, we, well, we, did, I mean, like I said, at that point, this was, I think, number 22 that we had been through. Okay. So if you take in to take that into account and all the things that you've learned. So if you, cause all, um, strategy comes from having reference points is sure. having experience. So parallel experiences that you can pull from to say, this is what we're going to do. We've been in almost every single type of scenario. We don't have gas. We don't have power. We don't have this. We don't have that, you know? And so all of that, we've, we've had to deal with that before on some level. So you were slightly prepped for that. Yeah, totally. I mean, we were, yeah. we were, I mean. You had gas, you had. We, we did all of our, all of our diligence first sure. and got everything we could. We, we, I mean, everything down to, we had hotel rooms at this one hotel, but I mean, really going out the day before and like surveying every building and kind of going, okay, well, the winds are gonna come from this way primarily at this hour, it's gonna clock this way, which room has the biggest window in it, you know, and at what time of the night is that gonna hit? I mean, we were wow. going deep into it because we had been through situations where we didn't do that and there was an issue. So you do that with everything. So your lodging, your transpo, your food, water, your water is easy. <laughs> yeah. So you start your comms, everything like that. I had a sat phone already. so. I sent half the team home. There was a, um, not home, but I sent, sent them to PR because it looked like Puerto Rico was going to get slammed with the same storm. There was six of us, six or seven of us in St. Croix to stage for those islands. And then when Maria was hitting, I said, God, you know what? Let's split us in half. Have those guys go do exactly what we're doing. I mean, this is what we do. We're specialists at this. So go do what you do best, get in the thick of it, hunker down, do the same process we did, do it in Puerto Rico, and we'll stay here. So there was like four and four, and I was it was myself, uh, Ben Bourgeois, who was uh, one of my oldest best friends. He was a pro surfer as well for a long time, one of the best in the world. Um, and but but he was wanting to help, and he was with me. I love having some of my old road dogs with me because it just makes it fun. Mm -hmm. um, and he's he's just so game. He's like, yeah, let's, we're staying, dude. This is awesome, you know, <laughs> and then, and then Jimmy Wilson, who was a, uh, a photographer, um, who was just down there volunteering for like a week with us. He was definitely working through it because it, you know, it's like first time, just like well, and then Fritz Pierre Lewis, who's my country director from Haiti, okay, who is the most badass dude on the planet, one of my best friends, just ultimate, amazing human, and he's just like. I mean, it, it, you feel safe with him no matter what. Not only is he a big guy, but he's just been through. He's like, John, he's like, it's, it's a storm. It's just a storm. <laughs> you know, he's like, <laughs> we're like. Just calm customer. Calm customer. It was so funny because he slept through at the storm. He slept through a Category 5 hurricane? Yeah, our, our ceiling was caving in. I had to wake him up. You're kidding. I'm not kidding. Yeah, our ceiling was like falling in from the weather and the rain and at the place we had to move rooms. I mean, it was, everything was just going haywire and he was snoring like face down on the bed. And then, and then we were filming there. It's actually on my Instagram where you were looking, there's like a series of five videos. Cause I had service during the storm and I'm like, I gotta, I gotta report, you know, I gotta, I gotta. So I was doing these videos that ended up on every news outlet in the world. It was you like, were the reporter because yeah. you were putting up your <laughs> yeah. stuff on Instagram and they're repurposing it. Yeah, they they text they direct message me on Instagram and say, "Can Thank we you. use this? Did you shoot this?" I'm like, "Sure, <laughs> it's all those, it's all those right there." I'm gonna play one of them. Yeah, we don't, um, we don't have audio, but uh, it'll it, we'll probably hear some of it. And I could turn it up a little bit. There's nothing. There's no audio that's gonna be there. Tell us, tell tell us what's happening though, John. Um, I think I think this one is when. 
Oh uh, yeah, I can hear it. <laughs> I can hear it too. <laughs> These are like the roof. I can see. This is the carport that's below four stories, um, and it's kind of open to the both sides of the building with like a funnel, uh, on like carport area that goes east to west. So uh -huh. the wind was able to go through it. And, um, I'm like, we gotta go down there and check that out. Cause I knew that we could stand in there and not feel the wind unless I put my body just on this into that. How, channel. how fast was the wind? Like 150 at that point. You're kidding. So like, no. you, wow. yeah, do these 150 gusts and, and you could, I mean, I feel them blow you, you just over. feel them. Yeah. You just put your head out. Well, oh my God. And, uh, I mean, this is just, how loud is it in that it's carport? So loud. It's so, so loud. Um, and there's, there's a funny video. I think it might be the one before this, but there's a funny <laughs> video. I don't know if I even, if, if it even made it on the post, but where Fritz, I, I like walk up through, through the stairs. I get Benny, Benny's right there on the right. He's the one in the middle. Um, I get Benny and he's like report being my reporter, you know, he's like, this is what's going on. And then a gust comes and he goes like, damn, he like, you know, flinches cause it's super loud and strong and scary. Yeah. And so, and it's normal. He's not acting anything. It's just like, whoa, okay. But we're, you know, we've kind of assessed everything. We feel good. And then I go over to Fritz and he's like, yes, it's uh, very dangerous out there. And it's uh, uh, very windy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just full straight face like it's all when he's talking about what's for breakfast yeah he's just like um yes you have to be very careful and it's very windy <laughs> you're just like he's all time yeah that's amazing but that's we got um, through it and um it was you know we're better for it and and I, I felt I always felt fine I felt like so how, how much of your time is allocated to being in disaster relief places like that, and how much of your time is doing the high level 30,000 foot, you know, I gotta run the business? It's a good question. Um, I I like to see myself as still that guy on the ground, but I'm not. Um, I have a good team that's handling most stuff. I'm there, obviously, this was very recent. And sure. I was there, and I had every opportunity to leave, and I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, there was a, I, I was gonna leave, I was because I had a great team on the ground and, and there was a there was an American flight that 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 was coming down to just pick people up for free. Big 737 or something like that was coming in because it's a U.S. Virgin Island. Sure. So they're coming in like last second and our hotel was like, you guys are Americans. You guys can go to the airport right now. You'll get on because people are trying to get off the island as fast as possible. And I remember packing my stuff up because I was like, boy, the boys got it. You know, I'm out. I don't need they don't need me here. And um, and I packed up with the other guys that were gonna go to Puerto Rico and I got to the airport and I'm like, I don't leave, I'm not leaving. And all the boys there were, that were jumping on the plane were like, what are you doing? We, we gotta, and, and I'm like, I'm staying. And those guys left to, to Puerto Rico and then I, and I took, and I was with the guy who dropped us off and I was back in the car go, and the car was going directly back to do more like prep work with Benny and Fritz and Jimmy. And I showed up at this like, this loading bay where we were getting a bunch of supplies and they are just all la like Fritz was just standing there. He's like, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> General never leaves his men on the field and like something like that. <laughs> all these funny, funny comments, but it's the truth because it's really where my heart is. Not that I want to be out there doing that all the time. It's not sustainable. Sure. Um, well, are, like, are you, are you married now? Do you, no. I'm in a relationship. Uh, she's awesome super supportive. Uh -huh. Um, I've spent the last nine years or eight years or so on um, the road, on the road. I mean, literally 10 days a month in, in the United States. Sure. For that whole eight years. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I probably shouldn't say it on the air, but <laughs> I don't pay state taxes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. No, you, no. I mean, it legally deserves le not pay state taxes. I think it's you. Le le legally, <laughs> legally, legally. I Le maybe sure, will now. Sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's my accountant was like, you, you actually qualify for this thing because you don't spend enough time in the country. You don't spend enough time in that state. Oh, wow. Even though I had a residence, I was never there. Now things are changing. I'm home a little bit more, but still, I've been on the road. I mean, I last year I did 350,000 miles. Wow. The year before I did 500. 
Wow. You know, and that's that's been my reality. I am transitioning out of that. I'm in a different place in my life. Uh, sure. I have a great team. I I don't want to be on the road that that much. Uh, doing that, I want. I wanted to always, or I want, not that I wanted and had this big vision, but now I want to build something that obviously will live on without me, and it, it's already at that point. But I'd like to focus on that. I don't. I'm adjusting to the thirty thousand foot roll. Sure. Like running the business, I don't. I'm not very good at it. I'm getting better at it. Um, I have great help. And I've made some good calls, I think, just out of instinct and just, you know, driven by the right reasons. Um, maybe not necessarily good business decisions, but then they end up being good dis business decisions because they're really the right thing to do. Um, and then they've also backfired on me too. Um, and you know, you, those, you, that's how you learn. And so it, it's been a, it's been an adjustment, um, I'm still on the road, or I have been, even though I've been at that that role now for for the last few years. I've still been on the road just as much, but just not being like in Haiti for two years, or you know, like in the sure. Philippines. Like before, I the Philippines would happen, and I'd go and I'd spend six months and just do it and develop everything. Now it's more like if I do go in, it'll be like this. For I went for a month on this one. That's um, amazing. It's yeah. uh, I mean, what you're doing is you're changing the world, you know? I mean, you are making an impact that's affecting people's lives in real time, which is unreal. Yeah, I'm, I, I wanna do it now. I don't wanna, I wanna see it happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like uh, tangible change, um, not theoretical change. Sure. Um, so I, I, I agree with you in the sense of um, doing stuff now, it's what I'm driven driven by. So, so they can check out uh, the website Waves for Water. Yep. If they wanted, can they donate? Can people donate? Totally. Online, easy to donate. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing I wanted to I want to clarify too um, is not when I was talking about the fundraising thing. It's not that we don't want people to contribute towards us in that way too. People do. I just didn't want my programs in the field to be hinged on that. Sure. So that's, so anybody who donates just direct donation to us, they can choose where that donation goes, like which project they want to support. They can do their own fundraiser on the site, like a crowdfunding, like a Kickstarter type thing, mm -hmm. but it's just to, f to fundraise in your personal way for one of our projects. So, you know, you can kind of build your own project page and say, I really identify with the Philippines, what they're doing there. And this is why blah, blah, blah. And you send that link out to your friends and they, they feel more connected to that rather than just saying, Hey, donate to this organization. Sure. So we've built a way for people to fundraise for us and stuff like that. I just, when they, when they do that, that money goes on top of the already secured funding we have from a partner in that place, which just helps us scale that even bigger. Sure. So they get, it's, it's the best of the scenarios in my opinion you've for 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 the, the individual and for the partner so i i encourage people to go do that if they want to support what we do it's just at wavesforwater.org um there's a bunch of pro, there's a bunch of information on there there's a bunch of projects we're doing you can kind of dive into you can create your own fundraisers the last thing is you you can do uh, our courier program which is our version of a volunteer program and what that is is like us piggybacking travelers going where they are already going. Wow. And they can crowdfund so they can say, I'm going to Nicaragua on a surf trip or I'm going to Thailand to study food. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going in September. They build their fundraising page. Their filter goal is five filters. They share that fundraiser. They crowd crowdfund for those filters. Then they get us, they, they get us as a resource. Basically they get our whole program condensed and they get trained on it in a individual way. Sure. So they don't have to worry about this type of stuff that we may have to worry about with the big UN program. They're just taking two filters. So we give them a whole walkthrough of everything they're going to encounter, the training of how to use the systems, how to implement them. And then, um, we're an ongoing resource for them while they're on their trip, but it's, it, it's a real DIY program. And That's amazing though. I mean, it's like your slogan, you know, do what you love and help along the way it's, and anybody can do it. Exactly.
anybody can do it. Not everybody will, um, which is totally fine. And I tell people that all the time. The courier program is not for everyone. You got to be a little bit bold. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to have a little bit in you to be able to what, go out what, there. How much time for people are listening so they can get a, a grasp on what it takes? You know, if they sign up for the courier program and they're like, okay, I want to do it. Well, how long is the training? Nothing. I mean, the, the preliminary stuff's easy because a lot of it's like digital material and or on the phone with us. Okay. Um, then they can all then they, they'll meet with one of our representatives somewhere, wherever close closest to where they live, to get hands on training. We also have training videos and everything like that. It's real simple technology, so that's that's not a long time uh, requirement. On the road, depending upon how many filters you do, you're talking about a half like one afternoon, a few hours. It's yeah. so easy. You're 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 in Thailand. Let's use that example. You're in Thailand studying food. You are focused on that, or just vacation. Let's say you're in your honeymoon. You're there, and you want to. We give you it. We give you sort of like a sequence that you can follow. But we also encourage you to just craft your own experience, totally based on the information we're giving you. But like, if you if you just wanted to follow our steps, you could go to some of the local restaurants that you go to and just start talking to the people there. Talk to your local taxi driver, talk to your local um, hotel where you're staying at, talk to the front desk person and just say, hey, you know what, I'm passing through here, I'm in love with this country, I'm studying food here, and um, I, I, I've done some research and I know that there's some needs around access to clean water and maybe you could help you know, point me in the right direction of areas of need. At the very least, they're gonna be like, I don't know, but I know somebody who does or would. Sure. And, they, and they can point you in that direction. It's so organic and, and actually a lot easier than you think. And and at the very least, you could just go stop by a school. I mean, you could just walk into any school in those little villages that you pass by because you can see the little school sign, walk in and just say, hey, can I speak to a teacher and just explain what you're doing and say, hey, I have this solution that'll really help these kids. I want to teach you how to use it. I want nothing in return. I'm not selling anything. I just want to teach you how to use this. This is my way to give back to a place that's giving me so much. Sure. And and I wish you the best of luck. Here you go. Train them up and leave it and go. Boom. Yeah. Done. <clears throat> so it's a you, there's a lot of different ways you can do that, um, and we're there for you every step of the way so that you can have guidance. But it's also supposed to be kind of you know. Uh, nerve wracking a little bit like, you know, intimidating. It's supposed to be that way. It's supposed to push you outside of your comfort zone and immerse you into a community more than you ever would have otherwise. That's amazing. It's a tool. It's amazing. Well, hey, I can't thank you enough for coming in today. Um, I'd love to continue talking. I actually got to get up on a plane in New York. No worries. And I thank you for get, having me. Get rolling. It was, it was awesome. It's what you're doing is incredible. And, and, um, I encourage everyone to go check it out. Sweet. Cool, brother. Later.